They have served and served well. They have helped shape character and personality, yet allowed creativity and individuality. They gave their lives to the education system. This is reminiscent, and this is their story. We forgot them somehow. We forgot them somehow. My name is Muriel Gill. That's what I was called at school. But since we are doing the naming thing, I am normally called Flores. So that is the name you can have me on as Flores Mary Muriel Gill. I was, you know that I was a student. I was a student teacher. I got a scholarship to go to the convent. That was an intending teacher's scholarship. So I was there for three years, at the end of which I wrote the school certificate examination and passed. And I got into teaching just like that. At the end of the time, I had to go back to the school where I came from and I got the scholarship. I went to Anglican Primary School and there I became a teacher. Um, it, it, it wasn't so hard. Um, I had to do one more exam to become a, a certificated teacher. At the end of that year, that's the year 1952, I was a certified teacher. My mentors really were, I would say, Sister Columba was the head teacher of the convent, and Mr. H.D. Boxill was the chief education officer, and Mr. Lester Vaughan, who was the principal of Anglican Primary School. They acted as my mentor because they encouraged me to teach. I wasn't fascinated with teaching just as I went, so they had to try to get me to see that it wasn't a lost cause. I could put my trust in it and hope for the best. Um, those were the men, those were the two men and a woman. So after I had spent three years at Anglican Primary School, I got an opportunity to go to Erdiston Teachers College. Now, that's the same thing I'm telling you about the mentor, because I didn't apply to go to Erdiston. I knew there was because people had applied there, but it didn't occur to me that I could apply. So there was one day I got a letter to tell me that I have been selected. And the letter came from the ministry, meaning from Mr. Boxill. And Mr. Vaughan agreed with the letter that I am going to Edison College. And that's how I got to Edison College in Barbados, spent two years, and came back down as a qualified teacher. From there on, it was um, um, Canon Lorry that told me to go down to the Ministry of Education because they need me there and he's allowing me to go. So I went down on Canon Lorry's suggestion, advice, and I go down there and I became a supervising teacher. So if you want, I really began the teaching thing at the top, not in the middle, not at the bottom. Because you cannot be, I left school, I became a certifi certified teacher, I became a qualified teacher, and then I'm a, a, a supervising teacher. Mrs. Gill was my tutor at Teachers College. 
And Mrs. Gill taught me that whatever you're doing, you must do it well. I retired in 19, 1990, but I, after that I worked for two more years, 19 to 19, December 1992. That would have given me 40 years in the teaching service. I left as a um, deputy chief education officer. As a young teacher just coming into, into the service, we had to look up to um, um, teach um, persons like um, Mrs. Gill. She was at the time, I think, a, the deputy, deputy chief, and she was very particular about education and the education of the children in particular. The role of the supervising teacher really was to teach the students, teachers who were on, to teach them, um, there was a curriculum for them to teach them that curriculum as well as to go from district to district to teach them there in their schools where they were. The, so I would go to Denry and teach the teachers there and also see them at their schools. You go from Denry, you go to Viewfort and did the same thing. And you moved from Viewfort, you went to Soufre to do the same thing. And so from there you're going from district to district to teach the young teachers um, to make them pass the course, to make them pass the exam because it was a long exam for them. They're going from PT1 to, to PA2 and then to be certified. Oh, that, that, that's the main thing. The, the question, you see, because we couldn't go until Saturday. Every Saturday we went to another district. And so we were going on the, on, on the bus, that's one thing. We were going on the sea from Soufre to here. It meant that you didn't always have the bus service. You had to go by sea to Soufre and come back. That wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for the teachers or for us. Because there were a number of supervising teachers and each supervising teacher was teaching some particular subject or subjects for the teachers to learn and to qualify. I cannot say any particular one thing, but I always felt good when the teachers responded and took part in whatever they were doing. And I will, would always, um, they, they'd say, Miss, you're happy. I say, yes, I'm happy. Yeah. Um, you see, um, the teachers had to be good at what they did. And any time they did well, I was happy. She set standards. So um, young persons like me really had to step up. And maybe who I am today as a teacher is in part because of, of Mrs. Gill. When the teachers just didn't have a clue as to what to do, and they eventually did well. That got me excited. Like a teacher didn't know anything about teaching and came on, and in the end, he was teaching for B or more at the same Anglican school, and he was teaching literature and things like that. And that got me excited. When you wrote an assignment for Mrs. Gill, unless it was perfect or almost perfect, she would not accept it. And so I learned that, and I learned that whatever I have to do, I think I would want to do it well. And I, I want to say thanks to Mrs. Gill for teaching me that aspect of whatever you have to do, you need to do it well. It's a different system from what I went on.
completely different. You see, we don't have all of these little um, PTs, PT1s and 2s until you get to PA2s. We don't have that now. Teachers are normally going to college and from there they go on into the schools. So that portion is wiped off completely. As a, as a qualified teacher, the teachers get qualified and some of them will tell me, Miss, that's not a good qualification huh? because we, are, we, are lear we learn but we didn't learn how to teach. So that was a particular challenge for a lot of teachers up to now. It's a challenge for them not only to learn from the text, but to get into the schools, to teach the children, and to feel comfortable with what they are doing. From the time I left until now, they are still struggling at the same point. How do you change a system with people doing different things at different levels and to find success with that. And one of the things that troubled me sometimes, you know I was a member of the teachers union. I was actually the president of the teachers union at some time. So I, I played a lot in the education system. So and then they know my reaction to Whatever the teachers are saying, they want more money, they want that, they want that. But my question to them is, when you say you want that, you will get it, but what will you give in exchange for that? So you cannot just qualify and get in the school and do what you like. You've got to be there to teach the people's children. That's the expression, they like that expression. So I'm using it because the teachers are not the ones answering the question. I tell them to go and teach the people's children. I taught children at, um, at Marsha Combined School. Um, that had to do with my going there to act as head teacher while they didn't find one yet. So I was there and I played with them. Um, one of the things that a lot of people remember is that I stood up there, especially Marsha people, and um, immediately I started, they, they saw a change. There was a problem of absenteeism. Thus she organized a skipping program which took place during the lunch period. What that did was make the children enthusiastic about skipping and coming to school. And therefore, by 1 p.m., all the children would have been at school. In addition to that, she visited their homes so that she could speak to the parents about the importance of their child's education. And that assisted in breaking the absenteeism habit at the school at the time. No, I was talking to a lady and she told me, Miss, you know, we have to get the police to go with us to a home if we want to talk to the parents. I tell her, but Antonio, you saw that I went myself. I never went with anybody, just myself. I went to the home to find out why the lady was not sending the children to school. And usually these women would be so upset because I came and they would say, Who else had the Tavinis, yeah? to their children and so I, I am glad that I was able to do that to be with children to work with them I had a garden in the in the yard there um, they planted things that was for teaching them they planted and they reaped and everything like that and Mindu came and put a a, 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 a pitch for me in the yard so that the children didn't have to go at Mindu. They pitched right there in the yard. There were two men on the staff, 
So I've caused them to be doing that. Mr. Burton was there and Mr. Gabriel. Now both of them have died, but the two of them to help the children to learn agriculture. And I, oh, one day, one day there was a, an incident there that I was happy about. The fellow never came back. I don't think he came back to St. Lucia, but he was a young boy and when he saw me, he wasn't happy. He said, a little girl has come to teach them. And he kept, mm -hmm. always that little girl thing. And one day I took them to Ganter's Bay, yeah. I took them to Ganter's and there they saw boats and ships and everything. And he didn't know that that was there. He was fascinated by these things. And so when he left school, he went back to the same place and got a job on a ship. And he has left St. Louis. I've never seen him since that time. See, so I did teach children. I believe that it isn't too difficult to teach children. Once you understand whom you are teaching and their troubles and their trials, some of them have troubles and trials. I remember teaching one class at Anglican Primary School. And that class, I had to take it upstairs in the church belfry so that I could teach the children. Because they came from the different classes in the school. And some of them could not write, some could not read, some could not spell, some could not, different things that they could not do. And I had a whole class of them and I had to teach them. But they didn't give me trouble up there. There was no supervisor over us. I that took them up there in the belfry and we laughed and talked and we did everything and we came down on Friday evenings. But they didn't give trouble. They, and I, 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 there was a particular fellow. Um, he, he, he thought that he had learned a lot because I met him on the bus and he told me, teacher, you know what? Now. I can read philosophy. And I, <laughs> I think that was a good shot. He told me I can read philosophy. And a man stood up there last week, it was last week, last week, Tuesday, and only stood up there to tell me philosophy is a good thing. I have read a lot of it, and I'm comfortable. People should really learn philosophy, you know? So I'm glad that they are coming to that point to tell me about philosophy that they are dealing with now, even though they didn't do it at school, and even though Lawson was in a low class. In terms of instruction for her teachers, she devoted time to teach her teachers so that they could sit the teacher's exam and move on to become qualified teachers. During her tenure, there was a 100% pass rate of teachers of the Marshall Combined School. There were other teachers on the staff with me. Uh, Mrs. Braffitt was a teacher on the staff at Anglican Primary School. Yeah. She was on the staff there. I, I cannot remember if she was a supervising teacher. I don't remember that, so I would not say that. But um, it, with all of these, a lot of teachers, um, there was Miss uh, Carmen, Camille, Camille Henry. You know there is a Camille Henry Memorial School. Miss, she used to teach home economics. And she had a way of getting me to do things that I didn't want to do. She would tell me, come and do it because you can, I know you can, but just that you don't want to. And she always would invite me and give me a sense of direction as to what to do and what she wanted accomplished. Mr. Vaughn used to teach us to be punctual, to be attentive to what we are doing. So I believe under his direction and instruction, I learned to make sure that 
you at school at the time you should be at school that you do the discipline that will keep the children quiet you don't have to beat them a lot you don't have to beat the children I can remember that in that martial situation I must have beaten two children as a little child I remember um, having said something to my class teacher which she didn't uh, she wasn't happy about because from that age, a tender age of 10, uh, I was very outspoken and I expressed, you know, my feelings. And uh, to many people, when children express themselves, the adult would see them as being, uh, you know, rude and so on. And so um, she reported me to Mrs. Gill, uh, the principal. And Mrs. Gill called me and uh, she asked me to get my parents. I went home and brought my, my grandmother. I lived with my grandmother then. And uh, at the end of the conversation, she said, you know, I'm going to give him a scolding. And you know, the, the intonation there at the end of that sentence, you know, frightened me. Um, she did in fact give me the scolding. And uh, of course, uh, soon after that, we seem to have forgotten, you know, about the incident. And I remember too that I didn't beat because they had, there were problems that prevented me from beating them. And up to now, they are friends with me. You see, because what they did was that they went up, the fellow went up to the bishop's house to complain for what the teacher had done. And he came back, I said, 11 o'clock, he's walking in through the school. I'm saying, but he's, not, he's crazy, he's not right. So I went to him to ask him, where is he coming from? What's his trouble? He said he went to the bishop to complain for Miss, one Miss Cooper who was there. And so I said, well, what did the bishop tell you? Oh, he said, Miss Cooper must not do these things. I said, so who you are going to say so to? He, he thought it was Miss Cooper. So I told him to go right back up to the bishop and tell him that I am at the school, in school. So if he wants, he has a problem, he must speak to me. Mrs. Gill was a person responsible for whatever happened at Camdu. And so the, the development of the, the reading material, all of the materials, the reading materials um, in schools were produced at Camdu. <laughs> See, I did the Camdu books, so I was spending a time in the ministry and spending the rest of the time at Camdu. Um, I don't know if you understand that, that I would go up to Camdu in the morning in the morning and I would work a lot there and um, I was showing my granddaughter the lady who worked with me at Kamdu, Beatrice McDonald. she's in the Ministry of Finance. She used to type up the material and I got the teachers to come from different head teachers, qualified teachers, teachers for the class and everything and for us to talk about the children, what they could learn, what they couldn't learn and how we might try them out and so until we wrote the books. Um, I was one of those teachers that worked on the Camp Do material with Mrs. Gilder. Um, the material was edited by Mrs. Gale. Um, she was also very careful that we did not take any published material. So all the material in Kamdu had to be um, stories or um, stories that were, were written by the teachers who were at the, at the workshop at the time. Now the books they, they, they wrote and read uh, the readers and workbooks, but the curriculum itself, only the teachers dealt with the curriculum. That was a different thing from the children's books. So we had the curriculum, one thing, and then the writing for the children. 
and this thing. Now, I, I, I don't think they use these books anymore um, because one day here they were on the radio saying that it was such a pity that there were no books, no, no, no information in any book about about Sen about whoever and everything. I say no, no, but I, I will, I'm going to correct that. So I called them and I said, listen to me. I have a standard four book that has everything about John Compton, about Derek Walcott, about Redrick Walcott, about Sen. Sen. They were used outside St. Lucia um, in the St. Kitts, Nevis, in Dominica, in all of these places, they used the Kamdu books. They were using the Kamdu books. The teachers were not concerned, so they went out there and put a stroke through it. I don't think they put a stroke through it deliberately, you know, but I believe um, in the changing of governments. Um, in changing governments, um, Didika's jewels brought a lady to do come do and she didn't know about curriculum and materials and she kept on throwing the materials that were there and then one day a lady stopped her uh, miss veronica simon at the university center she stopped her she told her but we have written the book so how can you throw them and so on and she went to the ministry and made a noise and so Didika sent to look to see why she was making the noise and started to search and then found out that the lady was not qualified in what she was saying she was qualified. So I did a lot of literature. I believe the, um, the, uh, those who changed the, the books were not conscious of the fact that you must write about your people and give them that notion that everything they did was good. So um, in that sense, if I had to go back there, I would say, but you all should not have taken these people from the books. Should not. Why? Because these are people we always need to know about. The children need to know about them. We, the grown-ups, need to know about them. Those who are coming need to know about them. So you cannot take them from the books. But you know, there are different ideas, and different ideas contend, and mine was not a good idea. <laughs> when I came home, I came and I started to clean my house to put things in place, to change from here to there and to do things like that. I never felt bored. I've never been bored. Um, sometimes people say, well, you see, I retire so I have nothing to do. But I retire and I always find things to do. Not in education in particular, but generally to keep doing things, to keep reading, to keep searching, to keep all of, to do all of these things. Mrs. Bill was a Deputy Chief Education Officer at the time when I was a young teacher at the Ave Maria Primary. You notice I said the Ave Maria Primary. You could not say the Ave. Mrs. Gill would not tolerate that. One of the things, and some of them call me here just to tell me, one of the things is that the people speak very badly. See John Public and people who are thinking that they know English and they called me there to tell me, Miss, you didn't hear that bullet. So what I think they ought to remember is that I used to teach against those bullets to teach people to speak correctly and clearly. Mrs. Gill, I remember her was somebody strong on pronunciation, enunciation, articulation. I could hear her saying that if the ends coming out prominently in the end, you not have the end, like we say now. The, the teachers? Oh, I don't know what message to leave for them because they're teachers of a different category, a different age group, a different kind of teacher. 
So if I were to meet them, I would have first to apologize for standing in front of them. And I say, well, you see, I used to be a teacher and I come to try to teach this. I hope you are open to be receptive to what I'm going to teach. Um, it, it was just wonderful working with Mrs. Gill. And it's a woman that I really and truly love because she shaped my career.